Welcome back to Bible study. We are now in chapter 2 of 2 Peter. And this is an interesting chapter. It's all opposing, all opposition to those who were leading those astray. And so the author of 2 Peter is pointing out all of the faults of those false teachers. So I uh, can't say there's a lot of um, positive, but it's important and we'll, we'll make it through chapter two. But also we are remembering how people can be led astray. So as we pray today, uh, we pray for those who may have gone astray to be brought back. Heavenly Father, it is your glory always to show mercy. Bring back all who have erred and strayed from your ways. Lead them again to embrace in faith the truth of your word and to hold fast to it. Bring them again into your light and truth and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, again, the bigger issues, the broader issues, were those who were teaching things against or not accepting what had been taught based on the teachings of the apostles, those first witnesses of Jesus Christ. And in addition to kind of trying to change that original message, there was another teaching or thing going around that Christ was not truly coming, that there was no return of Christ, and that that was also a big challenge, and that both of these together were leading people to feel that they could act in immoral ways, that somehow um, living a righteous life didn't, didn't matter so much. And so this was uh, very, very important, and it could have made a big difference of the direction of the church, because this was still fairly early, just around the end of the first century or the very, very beginning of the second century. So here at the end of chapter one, where it has been shown that the true message from God is both assured by the witness of those first apostles and connecting it to the message of the scripture, which uh, to that time would have been mostly the Old Testament, but some of the letters of Paul, uh, some of those sort of things that were already beginning to be well known. So that those two things affirm that this is the truth, that that's the true word of God through the Holy Spirit, but these others who speak are not speaking the true word of God. And so now it turns to, uh, well, it said, this is the truth. Let's look at those who are preaching the untruth. So we'll pick up in, in chapter 2, and um, we'll do verse 1 through 2, a little bit of verse 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring destructive opinions. They will even deny the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Even so, many will follow their licentious ways. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with deceptive words. So now the volleys are being uh, start shot at those who are being uh, called out as the false teachers. It's, it's something that um, is a big concern, and it is something that was pointed to in what we would call the gospel that Jesus spoke about that there would be those who would be false prophets or false teachers. And so in the Old Testament, there are clearly uh, those who are pointed out as false prophets. Sometimes the prophets that we know in the Old Testament uh, faced off with some of these false prophets and time, the test of time showed who was truly speaking God's word. And of course, those are the ones that we have uh, that we can read in the Old Testament. And then in our time, or the more Christian era, then there was the, um, sometimes using the word prophet, but also just calling them false teachers and just trying to make the point that they are basically the same. But again, Jesus did point toward 
this uh, as uh, happening. And an example of that is in Matthew 20, chapter 24. And this is a part of where Jesus is talking about the end of the age, uh, the return, the coming of the end, and the return of Christ. And so the, the uh, passage is from Matthew chapter 24 in verse 11. And Jesus is talking about how the followers of Christ could face persecution. And in verse 11 says, And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. So this is something Jesus himself had brought out. And now this is saying, hey, look, there are these people. Now, I think the truth is it's not limited to the, the end time. I think over the centuries there have been various heresies, uh, false teachings, and the church has had to uh, face those and then come through to, again, hold to the true message of God that is given in Jesus Christ and witnessed to by the apostles. Now, what's also being uh, brought out here is that their, their method, their means of bringing about this false teaching is, is very underhanded. It's, it's sneaky. It's starting with something that has just a bit of a ring of truth to it, but then takes it off and misguides people, leads them away from the actual truth. And with that loss of that moral compass, with that loss of that clear truth, then it becomes kind of an anything goes situation. And greed, there's, uh, that's apparently one of the motivations by these uh, false teachers. Well, picking up at the end of verse 3, through verse 6, uh, what it turns into is showing some examples of those who were under God's judgment in, through the Old Testament. So again, these, uh, these false teachers, their condemnation pronounced against them long ago has not been idle, and the destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment. And if he did not spare the ancient world, even though he saved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood on a world of the ungodly, and if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction and made them an example of what is coming to the ungodly. So the point that it's moving toward here is three episodes, events from the Old Testament have been alluded to, all of them um, related to the book of Genesis. And it first touches on something that is um, this regarding angels. And then it goes into something that's probably better known of the story of Noah. And then to the next one, which is something that's probably in between, sort of known, not so known, uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot, who was related, a relative of Abraham, was part of that story too, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well. These, these examples are, are brought out to say God does make judgment. God does make a decision against those who are unrighteous, and they will face consequences. So not to get the wrong idea that these um, false teachers will just get away with it and it's also rewarding if you follow them, you could, this is the same thing, sort of thing could happen to you. So there's these three examples. One is from the angels, sometimes called the watchers. Um, it's just a, something uh, from the way that story is described. And then, of course, the flood where, um, you know, the corruption uh, of humanity is judged. And yet, here's where there is that um, bit of hope that is lifted out that Noah and his family are those who are righteous and those who are saved. And as they, those who are righteous, are saved from the flood, Christians too can be saved. 
And then the third story is related to that of Sodom and Gomorrah, which uh, in this time of the early first century in Christianity, and right before that too, there was an understanding that, I found this kind of interesting, that around the Dead Sea towards the southern end, there are sulfur hot springs. And so there's both that kind of steaminess and gas that comes up and that odor. Now, years ago, or various times actually, we've traveled to Yellowstone, which is awesome. Everyone should try to visit Yellowstone National Park at some time in their life. And uh, around the geysers, part of what happens is the way the core of the earth is heating and there's water trapped under, underneath and it makes it come up and then sometimes it's just steamy and sometimes it does those big, huge spouts of, of the geysers. But there's also in certain of those areas, it's like it stinks, it smells because that, that sulfur smell comes through where those places have occurred, where there's these hot springs underneath the ground. But anyway, that in the south, south end of the Dead Sea, that was identified with uh, the place of Sodom and Gomorrah, that that was still residual of the condemnation of Sodom and Gomorrah. So people had a kind of vivid imagery in, in their heads about that. Well, that, that first example, like I say, uh, related to this um, angel's reference, that's not as well known as the other the story of the flood, and somewhat also known, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 6, almost to the very, very beginning there. So in Genesis chapter 6, we have this uh, interesting and unusual little interlude. Uh, we have had the coming of the... First the birth, or well, the beginning of creation, right? And then Adam and Eve. But then we've had the breaking with sin entering the world when Cain kills Abel. And then there are many, many generations, and we are coming closer to the time of Noah. And by this time, the way the Bible is expressing it, um, humanity has been on a path of sin has become greater and greater and greater. So that first uh, breaking in the Garden of Eden and then the uh, coming of the sin of murder, now um, sin is starting to reach greater and greater proportions. And so this is picking up uh, in chapter 6 in verse 1 through 4. And it's a really kind of different story. You might not have heard this before. It's not one of the ones you would probably have picked up in Sunday school. When the people began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them, they were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. And then the Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great on the earth, and this is verse 5, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And then it goes on, and this is where it segues into the story of Noah. So we have this really um, unusual uh, idea that some divine beings have looked upon humans and said, oh, well, she looks nice. Now, the way it's told is it's not extremely negative initially. It's almost like trying to come up with a way to say, how is there this kind of certain people who were extra big, extra strong? Think of um, Goliath, when Davy, David fights Goliath, um, you know, like that there was this group of people who were like that. And how do we explain that? And, and maybe this was an idea of how, how to try to explain that. But over time in the Jewish tradition, it was that it developed that these divine beings who breached to, to cross between heaven and earth, that that was another way that sin was showing that sin was reaching so far, it was actually 
even affecting heaven. So this is a way of expressing, too, the, the multiplication, the the broadening of sin, even to reaching heaven. And so this is the point where God has to act. And so that leads into the story of Noah. But these divine beings who uh, left their appropriate proper place are then punished by being sent to what would be considered the lowest level of Hades. Now, I think the our Bible uh, used the word hell, but in the, uh, in the Greek, it was probably closer to a not so much not so much a punishment punishment but just kind of a non non being kind of place but then there would be a day of judgment they're just they're there and keeping till that so part of this remembering of this story is to say judgment will come don't think it's going to get there people who are leading people astray are going to get past this even angels were being judged and then of course in the story of the flood those who were the wicked of that time, obviously were definitely judged. And then also um, we have, which is a little slightly out of order sequentially, um, we do have some of this, um, oh no, it does come out and the timing is right. Then we get to Sodom and Gomorrah. So this mentions Sodom and Gomorrah, but then it goes a little more into specifically about this relative of Abraham, Lot. So we'll pick up with chapter 2 and verse 7, 7 through 10. And if God rescued Lot, a righteous man greatly distressed by the licentiousness of the lawless, for if for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by their lawless deeds that he saw and heard, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who indulge their flesh in depraved lust and who despise authority. So the point is that there is judgment, but also that those who are righteous, those who keep uh, listening to God as God spared Lot, God will spare you. So uh, don't, don't give up. Don't be led astray. Hold to the teaching of the apostles. Hold on to Jesus Christ. And you have nothing to fear. And then there is... Um, this reference again to the Sodom and Gomorrah, and that takes us back also to the book of Genesis in chapter 19. So again, most of these stories take us back to, to Genesis, and this is where um, God looks upon Sodom, sees great evil, great wickedness. This is where Lot happens to live. Uh, Abraham and God have already had this very interesting dis discussion because God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham says, well, what if there's uh, 20, well, I forget how it, it starts out, I don't know, 50 or whatever, faithful people, righteous people, we would destroy it. Says, no, God says no. And then if there's 40, Abraham says, God says no. If there's 20, will you destroy it? God says no. If there's 10, will you destroy it? I may have added more numbers, but anyway, it gets all the way down to if there are five, can you find five righteous people in Sodom? No, 10, down to 10. It goes all the way down to 10. And apparently couldn't even find 10 righteous people out of Sodom and Gomorrah. However, his relative Lot lives there. And so because of that, also because it's um, implied that Lot also held to righteousness. So some representatives, um, considered angels, uh, messengers from God, go to, to find Lot. And when coming there, uh, the people of the town, again, are so evil, they want to attack these strangers. So we're picking up in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 15 through mm, 29. So they've, uh, these have come to stay with Lot. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, oh, and then they, so they tried to attack the strangers, uh, but at any rate, um, they're, they're there to give Lot the warning. So when the morning dawned, the angels turned to Lot, saying, get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or else you will be consumed in the punishment of the city. 
But he lingered, so the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and left him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, they said, Flee for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the hills, or else you will be consumed. And Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords, your servant has found favor with you, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot flee to the hills for fear that disaster will overtake me and I die. Look, the city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. It is, is it not a little one, and my life will be saved? He said to them, Very well, I grant you this favor too. I will not overthrow the city of which you spoke, and hurry and escape there, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. And therefore the city called Zoar, the sun has risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. And it's meaning little. So, so they get over there, and then it says, The Lord rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from out of heaven. So that's the good old story of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the, the point also is that if Noah and his family could be rescued, Lot and his family can be rescued, God can spare you. And then it's a reminder, yeah, there's going to be an ultimate justice. Uh, there, if, if you indulge, if, you're, if they slander God, if they live in a gre greedy way, you know, there's going to be judgment. Well, we also are being reassured, too, that even whatever happens around us, we want to hold on to God's word and God's grace. So picking up in um, verse 10 through 13, uh, chapter 2, Peter 10 through 13, says, bold and willful, they are not, meaning these false teachers, bold and willful, they are not afraid to slander the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not bring against them a slanderous judgment from the Lord. These people, however, are like irrational animals, mere creatures of instinct, born to be caught and killed. They slander what they do not understand, and when those creatures are destroyed, they also will be destroyed. Suffering the penalty for doing wrong, they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their dissipation while they feast with you. So uh, at this point, um, it starts to really uh, turn on a lot of... An, almost name calling or um, smear campaign. And this was this is still done to this day, unfortunately, uh, liking to point out every possible flaw in your opponent. Uh, but also here, what was more at stake wasn't just some going and voting. This was eternal salvation. So um, the use of hyperbole, expressing something um, more extremely so you get your point across. Uh, it really was necessary. It really did make sense. And so it's, you know, expressing that these people are um, like irrational animals. That's, they, they're not even thinking creatures, thinking beings. And they're only worth just... Um, being caught and killed. Like again, I, there's an extreme, extremeness to this kind of speech about these opponents, these false teachers. But they also bring out slander. They, they lead people in the wrong direction. It says they are blots and blemishes in their dissipation while they feast with you. It seems like there's a, a reference to in the early Christian church, there was a kind of gathering, and it would be called an agape meal, a meal centered on God's love. And in that kind of meal, people would be, it's kind of like an early potluck. Uh, people were meant to bring their food, share together, and it was meant to be a time of true Christian fellowship, a blessing, and then could ultimately conclude with sharing of the Lord's Supper. But instead of treating this time together as a blessing, as something good, these 
who are leading others astray would come to such a gathering and they would use it to indulge, eat too much, drink too much, um, probably speak in loud, raucous ways. And so they were going into a dissipation in bringing everything down and taking it away from the love of God and the love of one another, the love of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ especially. So they were transforming in a very negative way what was meant to be a meal of remembrance and, and blessing. So that in and of itself, too, was a very terrible thing that was being done by these false teachers. And it continues to describe them in, um, again, terms that are kind of extreme, but uh, again, to make sure people didn't miss the point, these false teachers, uh, picking up verse 14 through 16, it says, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. They have left the straight road and have gone astray, following the road of Balaam, son of Bozor, who loved the wages of doing wrong, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. So there's another, another lot of Old Testament stories that are being lifted up here. And in this one, it goes back to a time, and this is from the book of Numbers in chapter 22. So if you want to read the whole story, it's a little bit longer. Um, from Numbers in chapter 22, Balaam was a prophet who was known and respected for speaking the truth, um, delivering a message from God, but another king who wanted Balaam to prophesy in the king's favor had sent representatives to get uh, Balaam to come. First he says no, finally he, God says yes, go. So finally he comes and then he's supposedly to pr make a pronouncement that would go against the people of Israel. And so Balaam caves. It's, he's going to get like a big reward, like a huge amount out of if he gives in and does this and speaks not the truth of God's message, but what the king wants to hear. And so he becomes uh, not a true prophet, but a prophet for profit. Um, you know, just pay me and I'll say what you want. And th again, that's pointing back to these false teachers that, that they're in, in it for themselves. So then... Um, he starts to go to deliver this false message and somehow claim that it's actually from God. And on the way, there's an angel that's going to kill Balaam. And he can't see it. But the poor little donkey that he's riding on can see this angel that's ready to kill Balaam. And so this donkey keeps trying to divert and go around, and Balaam gets, you know, extremely angry at the donkey, he beats the donkey, hits the donkey, makes the donkey go forward. And finally, they come to this place where the donkey just can't go around, and it's trying to scrape along a wall. And, and finally, the donkey, God opens the donkey's mouth to speak, and the donkey says, you fool, don't you know I'm trying to save you? And then Balaam is able to see the angel that was going to uh, kill him. So this is, uh, this is the story saying it took... Um, a donkey had to talk to get this mad, crazy prophet to stop and not do the wrong thing. So if that can happen, again, God clearly opposes those who would try to deliver a message that is not truly God's word. So this is, and then again, this, this um, use of expression, though, that is, that is so um, you know, extreme, eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin, uh, accursed children. It's, it's, again, it's an exaggeration, but it's to make a point. It's sort of like, if you're really hungry, you say something like, I am so hungry, I could eat a horse. Well, I'm not going to eat a horse, but you're, you're, you're getting a point across. And the point, of course, is these people are wrong, they're bad, don't listen to them, uh, keep to the truth the truth of the Bible that we know 
don't let people uh, give you a message that is different. All right, so now um, the, the, the depths and the, um, the lostness of these false teachers is kind of what we go into next. And this picks up in verse 17, 17 through 19. These false, false teachers, these are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the deepest darkness has been reserved. For they speak bombastic nonsense, and with licentiousness, desires of the flesh, they entice people who have just escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For people are slaves to whatever masters them. So these, these false teachers, there's, there's no real substance to them. There's, there's nothing worthwhile. It's like you're thirsting terribly. You know where there's a, a spring of water. You get there, and it's dry. There's no life there. And that's what these teachers, these false teachers, are like. And it says they speak bombastic nonsense. Now I have to admit, bombastic, um, fun word, but I had no idea. I had to look it up. I was like, OK, what does that mean, bombastic nonsense? So bombastic, some other words, pompous, blustering. Uh, try to seeming extra important even though you're not, and then you know just nonsense doesn't. It's nothing of substance. No, nothing good there, and so they're they're just spouting in the air and they're saying nothing that's worthwhile, but they're still trying to entice people, lead people astray. So they're in such a bad place themselves. Let's just let them, they're in the dark. Let's let them stay in the dark, but don't go there yourself. All right. So then um, picking up in verse 20 and through the end. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overpowered, this last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment that was passed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb. The, t the dog turns back to its own vomit, and the sow is washed only to wallow in the mud. Wow, really not pleasant imagery there, those last two um, proverbs saying, you know, if you have found goodness and light and truth, and then you go back to the dark and falsehood, it's just... Like you were a pig who got cleaned up and just turned right around and ran and jumped into the mud. Well, those uh, powerful imagery. And the good thing that was given, this, this holy commandment, this is the message delivered through the apostles with the truth of Jesus Christ to be given life and then to turn away from life. Now, the thing is, yeah, as Christians, we, we are sinners. We have been redeemed by the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we still, we still sin. We are not eradicated of sin. But do we do it consistently, persistently, with no regrets? So this was what these false teachers were leading people into, to just not even see sin as sin anymore. But we know that we can turn to God for forgiveness. And one of the things that I feel is a good thing is this Martin Luther brought up something about baptism, which is to remember your baptism each and every day. 
each and every day. Remember that you have died with Christ, you have risen with Christ each and every day. Remember that sin has been washed away and you have a new day, a fresh start, and that Christ can lead you in his way of life. And so remembering baptism daily uh, made me think of a song that for me speaks of baptism, a song by Pastor Dave, and it is Water Flowing Free. We join together in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may you have a very blessed week.